Hello, Revive, <laughs> and guests. We are going to dive into chapter three tonight. Last week, uh, we were with John on the Isle of Patmos, and he got a visit from Jesus and seven angels. And these angels were giving John letters to seven churches that are located in what is now modern day Turkey. A lot of those churches don't exist anymore. But at the time, they were in existence. John was imprisoned in 95 AD. So those things that were going on in those churches were very important because Jesus was basically sending a warning that if you continue to do some of the things that you're doing, there are going to be eternal repercussions for your actions. But if you will but repent from these things that you are doing that are sinful, these are going to be your eternal rewards. And so the letters that we read last week, and the neat thing about the names of the churches is in the Greek, the, the Greek word had a definition to it, and it meant basically what was going on in the church. So the first church last week was Ephesus. The Greek meaning is permitted. And so what Ephesus' problem was, they were permitting doctrine to override love. They were the all-truth, no-love church. They were very disunified, um, bickering and fighting over doctrinal issues, secondary issues. I don't know what they were fighting over, but it was doctrinal things. And Jesus basically said, if you don't figure out how to walk in unity, the punishment is going to be, I'm going to come down there and remove your church from the list of churches altogether. Then there was Smyrna. The Greek word or the Greek definition of Smyrna is myrrh. Myrrh is a sap that comes from a tree, and it's used in burials. It's used in, uh, it's associated with death. And Smyrna was the persecuted church. And Jesus had nothing bad to say about the persecuted church. The next church with, was Pergamus, which means tower marriage. They were the compromising church. They were basically blending Christianity with paganism, Christianity with the world's way of doing things. Um, married to the tower, married to the world. So the last church was that we went through yesterday or last week was Thyatira. Thyatira meant odor of affliction. They were the deceived church. They were the ones that the odor that had seeped into their church that was killing their people spiritually was a doctrine called antinomianism. It's the uh, basically hyper grace, greasy grace. You can live any which way you want to live because grace has got you covered. That was the odor that was seeping into that church, and it was um, not being detected. So a lot of the people were spiritually falling away from Christ because they thought that they were allowed to. So tonight we're going to address three more letters in chapter 3, and I'm going to spend most of the night on the first one. It is probably the most um, eye-opening, challenging, uh, could be shake some people's theology a little bit, but here's what I'm going to tell you right now. If at the end you still want to believe what you believe, it is fine with me. <laughs> the end result, if, if you are living your life for the Lord and you have given your life to him, you really don't need to worry too much about what this letter says to these people. I think it's more for just as an eye opener. I'm just going to say that right now. It is an eye opener. So we're going to dive into the church of Sardis. Sardis means the red ones. And like I said at the beginning, when I look up these names, I'm like, the red ones? I don't have a clue what they're going to do wrong. We're going to get sunburned. You know, it's like the red ones. So as I start studying, and, and I totally understand at the end why they're called the red ones. Sardis was a very arrogant city. Back in the day, they built their city up on a bluff. It was surrounded by three sides, a bluff, and the only way up was basically the ramp to get into the city, and they heavily guarded that. Well, Cyrus, um, an opposing king, decided he wanted to take down Sardis. And so what he did is, and he'd already taken down Babylon, he surrounded the bluff down in the plains, and he waited, and he watched. He knew that the ramp was heavily guarded, but he was watching the sides of the bluff. And he was watching, history says, a soldier patrolling the top part in his helmet fell off, fell off down into the plains. They staged an ambush and waited four hours for the soldier to come down the ramp and come around the front so they could 
kill him. And he never showed up. So they went to go get the helmet. And the helmet was gone. And so they figured that there was a way that, that that soldier had gotten up and down the face of the bluff without being detected. And they found it. There was a secret passageway up the side of the bluff. So that night, why Sardis slept because they thought they were safe. Cyrus and his men scaled the front face of that bluff and took Sardis down. Sardis fell. Cyrus came on them like a thief in the night. Jesus alludes to this in the letter to the church of Sardis years and years later because that happened in 549 BC. So we are in 95 AD. So, But he alludes to that where they were so apathetic, negligent, thought that they were unconquerable because they were up so high that they let their guard down and they fell to the enemy. So we're going to start Revelation 3, verses 1 through 3. This is going to be Amplified Greek. For anybody that has missed chapter 1, um, if you're watching it online, I would say stop, play right now, go back into shaycaffee.com and watch chapter 1 because it'll explain what Amplified Greek means. It'll read different than your Bibles, but it's all the Greek definitions put back in place of the English words. So this letter to Sardis, here's... Here's John getting his information. Write this letter to the angel who exercises guardianship and superintendence over the church in Sardis. These things saith he that has the divine spirit of God, which manifests himself in seven energies or operations, and the seven angels of the seven churches who operate under the direction of Christ. I know your works, that you have a name that you are spiritually alive and are bringing forth good fruit. But you are spiritually dead and destitute of a life that recognizes or is devoted to God because you are given up to sin and trespasses. Be careful or else sin will overtake you. Strengthen your mind and what remains because you are in spiritual apathy and have fallen out of fellowship with God. And after close examination, I have not found your works, which spring forth from faith, complete in every aspect before God your judge. Keep in mind, therefore, what you learned by instruction from the gospel and examine yourself closely. Change your mind for the better and obey God's commands and utterly hate your past sin. But if, because of your spiritual negligence and apathy, you fall into sin and let it overtake you, I will come upon you unexpectedly with other evils, like a thief, and you will not know when that will be. This is one of their warnings. These Christians, the church, he's talking to Christians. So one thing you have to remember, these are Christ followers. These Christians have fallen into sin because of spiritual apathy and neglect. And he says, if you do not repent, you are in danger because sin can overtake you. And if you let it, I'm going to come unexpectedly to you one day like a thief in the night. Now, here is always what he does in these letters. He offers a reward for those people that do stay close to him, those Christians. And this is in Revelation 3, 4, Amplified Greek. Yet you have a few people, even in Sardis, who have kept themselves pure from the defilement of sin. And they are considered my companions and faithful followers. They will accompany me wearing brilliant white garments, which are worn during festive occasions, because they are worthy of the invitation. One thing about the word garments in the scriptures, you have to understand it's a metaphor. It's used metaphorically for your spiritual condition. So if you are wearing white garments, God has considered you pure. If you are in filthy, soiled, or red garments, you are considered spiritually defiled. If you are not wearing garments, if you are naked, you are considered unsaved. So when you understand that garments is a metaphor for your spiritual condition, some of these verses really take on a new light, especially the name Sardis. They're the red ones, which means this church is spiritually defiled by sin. Revelation 3, verses 5 through 6, you need to listen closely to what's tucked inside of verse 5. Christians who hold fast to their faith even unto death, against the power of their foes, their temptations, and persecutions. Those Christians shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase their names out of the book of life, in which the names of those recorded have been decreed to inherit eternal life. 
and I will acknowledge openly and joyfully their names while standing in the presence of God the Father and his holy angels. Anyone with ears to hear must listen and understand what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Okay, Sardis means the red ones. Their names are going to be blotted out of the book of life because they are spiritually defiled. They have been given a chance to wake up, repent, reposition themselves, return to Christ, and reconcile with him. But many of them will not. They will end up apostatizing. Now, apostatizing is not a new concept in Christianity or the Bible, but the part that challenges once saved, always saved, is the fact that it says in the letter to Sardis that people's names will be blotted out of the book of life, which means their names were once in there, and they will be blotted out for various reasons. So what is the definition of apostasy? Because a lot of people are like, well, what is that? What is it? This is just from the dictionary, and it says, total desertion of or departure from one's religion, principles, or party. You cannot apostatize from Christianity if you were never a Christian. You can't apostatize from something unless you were part of it to begin. You can't renounce it and depart from what you once did if you never once did it. Does that make sense? Okay, so apostasy is you were at one point a Christ follower, and you have either denounced it, renounced it, departed from it, abandoned it whatsoever. And there's going to be people that say, I no longer believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And they, for whatever reason, will depart from Christianity. That is called apostatizing. It says their names will be blotted out of the book. Well, what would be some of the reasons that people can do that? Or why would they do that? And is that the only way to apostatize? One of the ways, and I found this when I was amplifying a scripture, verbal apostasy, where you verbally denounce it. Why would somebody do that? In Revelation 21, 8, I'm shooting way far into the book, but amplified. Um, this, I'm going to read it to you first in King James Version. And it says, these are people that are going to have uh, their place assigned to them in the lake of fire. He lists off some people. The very first one he lists is the fearful. And it says, the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. When I read this verse in the King James Version, the first word was fearful, and I thought, well, that's a bit harsh, seeing as I have Christian friends that battle with fear and anxiety, and that's not going to help their condition any. You know, it's like, oh, don't be scared. We're going to end up in hell. Okay, what you have to understand, when you look up words in the lexicons, a lot of times they don't mean what we think they mean. And the, the word is dilos. Fearful is dilos in the Greek. Listen to this definition. Christians who through cowardice give way under persecution and apostatize will have their place assigned to them in the lake which burns with fire. The second person in the second group is the faithless people that were never Christians in the first, first place. So he's like, Christians who through cowardice renounce it. There's people right now in third world countries, and ISIS is decapitating them because they refuse to denounce their faith. But there are others who will say to spare their lives. I renounce Christianity. I don't believe in it anymore. That is called verbal apostasy. So is there forgiveness for that? Well, what did Peter do? He denied Christ. He repented from it, and he was forgiven for it. So I honestly, in my heart, I could be wrong, but I even believe that there's forgiveness for people that apostatize, and then realize, oh my goodness, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I do believe. I do. I wouldn't want to risk it, but in my heart of hearts, because of Peter, I, I believe that people can do that and, 
and repent from that. But still, it's such a it's such a huge thing. You don't want to gamble with that one. But the fact that that's in there. Here's Revelation twenty one eight, um, amplified in the Greek. Christians who through cowardice give way under persecution and apostatize, the faithless, the abominable, the murderers, men who indulge indulge in unlawful sexual intercourse, fornicators, those who practice magic, worship false gods, and all false witnesses. The English word was liars. I'm like, well, we all going to hell. The Greek definition for, for liars is false witnesses. If you are a false witness, it says you will um, have your place assigned to you in the lake which burns with fire. So do I have your attention yet? <laughs> Everybody wake. Bible got your attention yet? Okay. All right. And this, is, this letter, I'm telling you right now, this letter is it's challenging. It's an eye-opener. Um, so... The other definition of apostasy, though, was departing from the principles of your religion. So how can you depart from the principles of a religion? We have to know what the principles are. God's principles, his divine law, the laws of God that are written on our hearts. So when you depart from those in God's eyes, that is considered apostasy, more through your actions than by your verbal words. And I found that when Jesus was talking to his disciples in Matthew 24 about the end times, and he was telling them about all the different judgments that are going to happen um, during that time, and he started talking about Christians. Uh, he called them servants, though. A lot of times he refers to Christians as servants. And he says, these servants, I need you to be watching for me and waiting for my return. And I'm going to read it to you. This is Matthew 24, verses 40 through 47 in King James. But I amplified um, 48 through 51 for you. So the first few verses are going to be King James. This is right around the rapture time. Then shall two be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give him meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all of his goods. He's talking to Christians, servants. Okay, ready? Verses 48 through 51, amplified in the Greek. But if that servant shall think to himself that the Lord is delaying his coming, and he begins to beat or strike the ones who served the same master as he used to, and party lavishly and get intoxicated with the drunkards, the Lord of that evil servant shall come when he is not expecting him in an hour he is not aware of. The Lord will assign him with the other pretenders and hypocrites where there will be weeping, extreme anguish, and utter despair of those men consigned to eternal punishment in hell. He's talking to Christians. Those people that get tired of his waiting, oh, he's never coming back. Oh, he's been saying he's coming back for years. He's never coming back. And it says they begin to beat or strike the people that used to serve the same, that, that serve the same master as he used to. And they begin to party and live in an immoral lifestyle. It says those people are going to be assigned with the hypocrites. And I'm like, that is physical apostasy in God's eyes. Somebody actually asked me, is there more ways to apostatize than just verbally? And I'm like, according to these verses, yes. He, he looks at departure from the principles of the religion as apostasy as well. Um, let's see. So I've got another couple verses on apostasy, and, and it's only because if you're ever going to teach on this subject, Sardis is the church. That, that speaks mostly about it. Second Peter 1, 4 through 10. 
you've got a, not a lot of these things in your notes because I couldn't afford to print 11 pages of notes for you guys. You have the, you have the condensed version. But if you go on shaycaffey.com Sunday and watch chapter three, below is a purple banner that says print here. You can print, download notes. I'm going to actually post my notes this time instead of the class notes for the Church of Sardis. So if you want the complete Shay's teaching, feel free to print that out <laughs> at home on your printer. But here's 2 Peter 1, 4 through 10. So you can just listen to me. I don't think it's in your notes. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. This is Peter talking like we've been given precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue add knowledge, and to knowledge add temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, add charity, which is love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowing of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. It means he's short-sighted. He's not looking at the big picture down the road. And he hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. He's been purged. He's a, he's a Christ follower. He's a Christian. And it says, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. And when I look up the word fall, the Greek word is pateo, and it says to incur the loss of salvation. If you do these things, add to your faith virtue, to your to your virtue, knowledge, to your knowledge, you know, temperance. If you add these things, you're going to bear fruit. It's just going to happen. But if you don't do anything with this gift that Christ has given you, you're not going to bear any fruit at all. And it says you need to do this to make your calling and your election sure, to, to guarantee that you will not fall. You will not incur the loss of salvation. I'm like, as I'm finding these Greek definitions in totally different words, totally different verses, it's just adding to my understanding of this is salvation is serious business. It's not, it is a, a wonderful gift, a wonderful gift, but it is not something that we can just take and take advantage of and expect to have a good result. We are supposed to bear fruit and further the kingdom. So here again, it's more verses. The warning that you can lose your salvation through apostasy. He looks at departure from the principles of Christianity as apostasy in his eyes. Is there repentance for that? By golly, yes, the prodigal son. Just get people to repent and come back to him. After the Antichrist makes his public appearance in the tribulation, there is going to be a great falling away. And here is yet another verse with a whole different word that speaks of the exact same thing. It's in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 2 through 3. This is King James Version. It's talking about the upcoming tribulation. That ye not be soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any, mean, by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. So fall, when I looked into falling away, there's going to be a falling away before um, the day of Christ. The Greek, the Greek word is apostasia, which is where we get apostasy from. Um, the English word is falling away. So verses that have falling away in it, apostasia. It says, a falling away, a defection, or an apostasy in the Bible, namely from the true religion. So you have defected from the true religion of Christianity. During the tribulation, there is going to be a great defection, a great falling away from Christianity. 
says it in Thessalonians. 2nd Thessalonians. I can't sometimes say that word. 2nd Thessalonians. <laughs> we have to realize the gravity of apostasy. Um, a man argued that no man can pluck me from my father's hand. How many of you heard that verse? No man can pluck me from my father's hand. And I said, I agree. No man can take your salvation from you. But you can sure walk away from it. You can dive out of your father's hand in your own volition. The Bible doesn't say no man can apostatize. It says no man can take your salvation from you. I want to pose a question. If, if once saved, always saved. And I know that there's people, many, many people that believe that. Once saved, always saved. If that is the case then why would there be warnings against apostasy in the Bible? If you can't lose it, then why would it matter if you apostatized? If, and if you can't apostatize, well, then why does it talk about people that can? I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like you have to, and if there's scriptures that literally say to incur the loss of eternal salvation, if there's even just one, you can't say always. Once saved, always. You can't say always if there's one exception to a rule. Um, many would argue that blaspheming the Holy Spirit is the only unpardonable sin. Um, and, and then I would ask them, but what is blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Like, what is it? Because we would need to make sure we don't ever do it. <laughs> if, it's, if it's unforgivable. We know apostasy is forgivable. <laughs> uh, but this blaspheming the Holy Spirit thing, like, what is it? And I get a myriad of answers. A lot of them just guesses. It comes from Matthew, and we're going to cover it. I'm going to tell you exactly what blaspheming the Holy Spirit is. Matthew 12, 22 through 32, King James Version. This is um, Jesus, and he's healing people. It says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. It may not be in your notes, guys. And he healed them, insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, Oh, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he shall spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin, got that? All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever shall speak at the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. That is a heavy charge. We need to understand what that is. I looked up in the Thayer's Greek lexicon off of blueletterbible.org. Um, blasphemia is the Greek word. And it says impious, which means irreverent, impious or reproachful speech, injurious to the divine majesty of the object, which the object in this verse is the Holy Spirit. So irreverent and reproachful speech that is injurious to the divine majesty of the Holy Spirit is not to be forgiven. And when I looked into the Vines Expository Bible Dictionary, there was a note specifically on this. And it said, As to Christ's teaching concerning blasphemy against the Holy Spirit in Matthew 12, 32, that anyone with the evidence of the Lord's power before his eyes should decree it to be Satan's power, exhibited a condition of heart beyond divine illumination and therefore hopeless. Divine forgiveness would be inconsistent with the moral nature of God. As to the man of as to the son of man, which is Jesus, in his state of humiliation, there might be a misunderstanding, but not so with the Holy Spirit's power demonstrated. So basically, 
in my understanding of those two things, blaspheming the Holy Spirit would be when we see somebody do something miraculous, like somebody's healed or somebody, you know, whatever. And we attribute that miracle not to the Holy Spirit, but to Satan. He says, that's, you have just given credit to Satan for something that the Holy Spirit just did. And, and even though it's not the same thing that I've done, I will admit that when I read that definition, the first thing that popped into my mind is those TV evangelists that are healing people and, you know, jackets are flying and people are getting whacked. And, and I just, I wondered, I'm going to be honest, I have wondered, are those people really getting healed? Or are those people actors being paid to do that to increase this man's ministry? And then, but when I read that, I'm just like, okay, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit didn't do it, the devil did it. That's not what I was questioning. I'm simply questioning sometimes, is this really real? But it, it checked my spirit to be very careful, Shay. Just be very careful. You don't know that person very well was healed by the Holy Spirit. It might have been a very extravagant gesture that happened, but the Holy Spirit healed them. And here you are questioning the Holy Spirit, healing that person because of the way in which he did it. And I was just like, halt, I ain't doing that again. If those people are hired actors, they're going to answer to God. I'm going to answer to God too. So I'm very cautious now when people start talking about TV evangelists. I'm like, zip it, zip it, <laughs> because of that right there. Now, granted, it's not the same as saying the double, it's not, but I just feel like you're, you're kind of treading on that thin ice. So if you haven't blasphemed the Holy Spirit, I haven't, you know, attributed his miracle to Satan. I haven't done that. But you're living in a lifestyle of sin. The question posed last week was, how far can you apostatize before you cross the line that you can't come back? Is there a line? And I tried to explain it the, the best I could on the spot <laughs> last week in chapter 2. But I want to expound on something. In 1 John 5, 16 and 17, this is King James Version. It says, if any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. If there is a sin unto death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not unto death. And I'm like, there is a sin unto death? Is it the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit or is it something different? And I was hoping it would tell me. But here's what it said. And oh my goodness. In the Thayer's Greek lexicon again, Blue Letter Bible, uh, sin, the Greek word is amartia. Listen to this definition of 1 John 5.16. An offense of such gravity that a Christian lapses from the state of zoe, received from Christ, into a state of thanatos, in which he was before he became united to Christ by faith. And if you don't know Greek, that would just be Greek to you. Like, oh, he's lapsing from Zoe to Thanatos. Don't have a clue what that means. All right. The Greek definition to ponder, though, is the fact that Christians can lapse. Lapse means go back from a state of Zoe to a state of Thanatos. Well, what is Zoe? It is the Greek word for life. And there's many different variations of Zoe in the Bible, but many of them talk about the life that you receive when you first initially put your trust in Christ for salvation of your soul, and you're saved, it begins in this life, but it continues and increases in heaven. It reaches its fulfillment and its completion, perfection in heaven. But you begin to experience Zoe life now as Christians with the blessings and the benefits of being part of Jesus's family. So you can lapse from a state of Zoe into a state of thanatos, and thanatos is the Greek word for death, which you were before you got saved. Um, the thanatos, I want to read it to you. It says, thanatos, metaphorically used, the misery of a soul arising from sin, which begins on earth but lasts and increases after death of the body, life before conversion to Christ. So where Zoe life starts now, 
for those who put their faith in Christ, continues and increases in heaven. Death begins now for those who live their life in sin, continues and increases in hell. So if a Christian can lapse from a state of Zoe life, which means they're saved, they're beginning their journey, they can lapse from that back into a state of death to which they were before they were converted to Christianity, then once saved, always saved is refuted, yet once again with a whole nother Greek definition and a whole nother verse. Continual sin. Continual sin. God looks at that as apostasy. You're departing completely from the principles, his divine principles of the law. He died to give us zoe, not thanatos. John 3.16, guys. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, die, but should have everlasting life, zoe. And when I looked up, should not perish, I thought, ooh, is it going to be thanatos? It's actually a different Greek word. Um, it is apolemy. And it says, you shall not perish. And it's used tropically, which means metaphorically. It says, to incur the loss of true or eternal life, to be delivered up to eternal misery. You shall not incur the loss of eternal life if you put your trust in him. You won't incur the loss of it. And you won't be delivered up to eternal misery. He died so that we don't have to end up in hell. But we can have Zoe, everlasting Zoe life. And the definition is incredible. It says, a life active and vigorous, devoted to God and blessed, a part to be given to us here now for those who put their trust in Christ, but after the resurrection to be consummated with new accessions, among them a more perfect and glorified body that will last forever. We are going to get so many things come to completion, but we get to experience Zoe part of it now for those who put their faith in Christ. That's why he died for us. That's why he's so against sin. Because living in sin before conversion leads to death. It leads to thanatos. And apparently from all of these scriptures that I gave you so far, continuing in sin after conversion lapses you back into a state of thanatos if there is no repentance. So I say if you have a breath in your being, and you are living in sin, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. Repent and come back to him. Reposition yourself. Return to him and repent. Also, it's a heart issue, guys. It's such a heart issue. He just wants you to, to care enough to want to pursue a life with him and to produce fruit. We're all going to sin. We're all going to sin. We're all going to stumble. We're all going to fall. It's what you do after you sin that matters. Get back up, repent, and come back to him. I don't know what the line is. I don't know that there is a line that if you cross, you can't come back. I would just say don't toy with it. Don't be the little two-year-old who said don't stick your fork in the outlet. I'm not sticking it in. You're messing with it. You're, you're, you're pushing the limit. Don't even, don't even go there. Do you want to live for Christ or not? All right. Here's the problem. People are being taught that they don't have to repent. People are being taught that as long as they don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit and commit the one unpardonable sin, that they're safe. Do you guys feel safe after all the scriptures that I read you tonight on, on teaching that? I don't. I believe that there are ways that you can apostatize and incur the loss of salvation. That's me based on the scriptures that I've read. I, I might not change anybody's mind. That's then I then great. You're probably living for the Lord. You're not worried about it anyway. Because I know I'm saved. I know my life. I know my relationship with him. I, I'm I know me, so I feel like I'm eternally secure. <laughs> but I can only answer for me. Um so then a few people changed the phraseology up and they said, okay, now once truly saved. Always saved. Have you guys heard that one? Once truly saved, always saved. And I'm like, okay, well, what do you mean once truly saved? Well, they're like, well, if you're truly saved, 
you wouldn't apostatize. Um, so if you apostatize, you were never truly saved in the first place. And I'm like, but what is apostasy based off of? Sin. Okay. So basically, if somebody is living in sin, then you get to say, well, they were probably never truly saved in the first place. So you now you just open up a whole nother can of worms. To me is a bigger pro to me is a bigger problem because I know people that gave their life to the Lord that honestly, truly believed that God existed, that he is the author and the creator of all things, the author and the bestower of salvation through Jesus Christ. They believed that. They believed in Jesus as the Son of God who came to the earth and lived a sinless life, who died on the cross, who, who rose again, who can forgive you of your sins if you ask him. They believe in all the foundational principles of being saved, and they put their faith in that. Do you mean to tell me that years down the road when they, they hit a bad time in their life and somebody that they loved died and they blamed God for it and they fell away, that they were never truly saved in the first place? Well, then none of us are safe. To have to live wondering every time I fall or whatever, gosh, I wonder if I was, if it took, was it? Was I one of those people that it had, my prayer didn't matter? That it didn't count? Like, I would much rather know that when I lead somebody to the Lord, at the moment that they put their faith in Christ, they were given a gift of eternal salvation. And now it is up to them to begin to grow up in God, grow up in Christ, and bear fruit. The ball is in their court, and they have the Holy Spirit helping them. I would much rather put my faith in that than I'm going to lead you to the Lord. But there's no guarantees it's going to take. Um, I, I can't. I <laughs> once truly saved a wife. I mean, I kind of get what they're saying, but here's the thing. Church is split over this. Split. But the end result if you look at the end result of both views, they end with thanatos. They end at the same place. Whether you thought you had it and you never did because you apostatized, or whether you had it and you walked away from it, the end result of both of these views is death. Stay away from sin <laughs> because sin is the deciding factor that both of these sides take make their views based off of he died to free us from the grace doesn't give us license to sin it gives us the power and the conviction not to and we need to ask the holy spirit to help us daily holy spirit i am battling with this sin and for whatever reason in my own strength i cannot overcome it transform me into the image and likeness of jesus do what you have to do to bring me to my knees and get my attention help me i don't want to be like this I don't want to struggle with this sin. He can work with a heart like that. It's a heart issue. He can work with that. All right. The parable of the sower, if you read the parable of the sower, and, and I'm going to read part of it to you, it lines up with when you receive the word, you were given the gift, and now it's up to you to do something with it. Um, I'm going to read where Jesus explains it to his disciples. In Matthew 13, 18 through 23, this is New King James. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives the seed by the wayside. He's unsaved. He never received it. Okay, so that was seed that was sown on the wayside. Enemy snatched it away never received in the first place, it says, but he who received the seed on the stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Okay, he has the word. He has received it. He's got the gift. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles most translations say he falls away. He apostatizes. Why? Because tribulations and persecutions. Well, what did I read you in Revelation 21.8? Christians who through cowardice give way under persecution and apostatize will have their place assigned to them in the lake which burns with fire. He's just said, that's your stony ground. 
persecution, tribulations arise, and they denounce it because they have no root. They have no foundation in it in themselves. Now he who received, and that was Christians. He who receives seed along the, among the thorns is he who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Well, here you have the person that had the riches of the world. You know, this, that verse that says it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. It's not because of the money. It's because they end up not needing God. And, and it, so it's like this. This is the one that the branches that produce no fruit. What does the Bible say happens to those? They're cut off and burned. So the parable of the sower lines up with you. When you put your faith in God, you got the gift. Now it's up to you to do something with that gift. We're supposed to grow up and produce fruit for the kingdom. Sardis was the church that had received the word. That's why they're called a church. They're a body of believers. But it says because of their own negligence and apathy, they let sin overtake them. They were, became spiritually defiled. They were the red ones. And it says their names will be blotted out of the book. That means their names were in him. He told them, be watchful. Keep in mind what the gospel teaches and examine yourself carefully. This is what he's telling Sardis. Change your mind for the better and obey God's commands and utterly hate your past sin. But if you stay spiritually negligent and apathetic, sin will overtake you. And when I come to you, it'll be unexpectedly as a thief in the night. And you won't know when that will be. Jumping forward to Revelation 16, 5, King James Version. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his, his garments, lest he walk naked and the world see his shame. Here's that garments, metaphor for spiritual condition. Blessed is he that keeps his garments, lest he loses his garments and becomes naked, which naked is unsaved. White garments, purity. Soiled, filthy, red garments, spiritually defiled. You might as well be as good as dead. Naked. You're not saved at all. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he shall walk naked. The red ones, blotted out. Matthew 7, 13 through 20. I'm giving you tons of scriptures tonight. NIV, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. Zoe, and only few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. And every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. If the gate is so narrow that few find it, then we can't listen to false prophets who are saying all roads lead to heaven. All religions end up in the same place. That's what he's talking about, those religions that teach you that it's an all-inclusive club. It's, it's not all-inclusive. There's, <laughs> there's scriptures that say right out front. It's not. A lot of people think they're going to make it in. It says these churches, these letters to the churches, oh, my word. It's like you better check yourself before you wreck yourself because they're all, other than two, they're all doing something wrong that's going to lead to an eternal repercussion that they're not going to like if they don't repent from it. I amplified Ephesians 5, 14 through 17 a long time ago, and I went ahead and just added it to the notes that are online. It says, Wherefore, he says, Arise from a state of moral sloth to an active life devoted to God, you who yield to sin and are indifferent about your salvation. Arise from your spiritual death, and Christ will pour upon thee the light of divine truth as the sun gives light to men aroused from sleep. Take heed that you conduct yourself carefully, deviating in no respect from the law of duty. Do not be foolish, but in your actions be governed by religious reverence, devoutness, and integrity. Make wise use of every opportunity for doing good. 
because the days are full of peril to Christians' faith and steadfastness. Therefore be ye not unwise, but understand what God has purposed and determined that you shall do to bless mankind through Christ. Christ is saying, wake up. Wake up, my church. Wake up, my bride. Remember how you received the word. Repent. Change your heart. Reposition yourself. Come back to me. He's alluding to Sardis, who slept while the attackers came up and attacked them because they were spiritually negligent, apathetic, and they thought they were okay. And they got overtaken by the enemy. They were supposed to have watchmen on the walls, but they only put watchmen on the one side where the ramp was. They left all the other walls unprotected. You know, in the Bible, the watchmen, the watchmen are the pastors, the Christians that are supposed to be watching out for the enemy and warning people. In Isaiah 56.10, this is New Living Translation, it says, For the leaders of my people, the Lord's watchmen, his shepherds, are blind and ignorant. They are like silent watchdogs that give no warning when danger comes. They love to lie around sleeping and dreaming. And I have to say, and Pastor Shannon's not here tonight, so I can brag on him, we don't have a blind and ignorant shepherd here. We don't have a silent watchdog. He preached a sermon a few weeks ago. It was on apostasy in a roundabout way, um, but it was flat out. It challenged even the veteran Christians. And I was just like, oh. And here's the thing. Revived Church is in its beginning stages. We've been here about three years. And to have a pastor that loves us enough that he is willing to offend us, to bring us the truth instead of placate us to build the numbers, I was just like, oh, <laughs> amen. You know, because I would rather be in a small church that is spiritually alive and watching out for the enemy than a Sardis church that's huge, that is spiritually dead and letting people and tolerating sin to build the numbers. I'm like, give me the word and give me the truth of the word. I don't care if you offend me. Jesus offended people all the time. Okay, there's hard words in this Bible. <laughs> I need to be able to stomach them. So yes, give me a pastor like that any day. Truth and love. And he did it with love. I mean, he always adds humor to his messages that make you crack up at yourself. But um, the enemy is alive and well on planet Earth, and he will do and use whoever or whatever he can to spiritually kill you. So you have to be able to recognize what he's using, whether it be a false doctrine, um, a friend that's telling you something in the Bible that gives you license to sin, whatever it is, do not justify sin. Just don't do it, especially after the church of Sardis. It says, all who are victorious will be clothed in white, and I will not blot their names out of the book of life. We've got to be overcomers. And then he ends, anyone with ears to hear must listen and understand what the Spirit is saying to the church. I just went a full hour on Sardis. I'm going to take a few extra minutes tonight. Um, don't have the Sardis syndrome and spiritually sleep through your life. Philadelphia. Ready for the next one? This one's short. Um, Philadelphia is the, it means brotherly love. They were the loving church, and they were the one that Jesus had nothing bad to say about other than Smyrna. Revelation 3, 7 through 13. And to the angel who exercises guardianship and superintendence over the church in Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is pure, sinless, upright, and holy, Jesus, the true Messiah, who has the power to receive people into the Messiah's kingdom or exclude them from it. He can give people access to the blessings of God's kingdom, and no man can obstruct their entrance into heaven. Or... He can obstruct one's entrance into heaven, and no man can open the door. Jesus says, I know your conduct, which is measured by the standard of religion and righteousness. Behold, I have set open doors before you that no man can shut, for you have little power and resources, but you have observed my word, and even for fear of death or persecution, you have not denied that I, Jesus, am your master, and you have not deserted my cause. Behold, I will make an example of the assembly of men whom Satan govern, whom claim that they are Jews by reason of birth, race, or religion, but are not. They are liars. Behold, I will make them come forth and pay honor and respect at your feet, as they would men of superior rank, and they will know that I love you. And because you have observed and waited patiently for my return from heaven, I will also 
keep you at a distance, guarding you and causing you to escape safely from the power and the assaults of Satan, which will come upon the earth, and the period of time will I, when I will inflict evils upon mankind in order to prove their character and steadfastness of faith. Behold, I am coming without delay, so don't let go of what you have faithfully kept. Let no man cause you to fail of the promised and hoped for prize. Your Bibles will say, let no man take your crown. Can't take your crown. Crown is eternal blessedness in heaven. But it says, cause you to fail of the promised and hoped for crown prize. To Christians who hold fast to their faith, even unto death against the power of their foes and temptations and persecutions, I will assign them a firm and abiding place in the everlasting kingdom of God, and they shall never leave. And I will write upon them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon them my new, more superior name. He that hath an ear, let him hear and understand what the Spirit is saying to the churches. I just want to touch on one thing of this church. The word from says they will keep them at a distance, causing them to escape from the power and the assaults of Satan and the tribulation period of time. Okay, pre-tribulation rapture teachers use Revelation 3.10 as a key verse that says we are going to be taken from the world before the tribulation starts because the Greek word from ek means removed. All right. So here I want to I want to show you a trick when you're amplifying scriptures or using the lexicons in Blue Letter Bible. This word escape safely from in verse 10. The Greek word is ek. When you're looking in your lexicon and you find Revelation 3:10 and you read the definition before it, it says to keep one at a distance from. Well, that really didn't, I mean, it could be interpreted two ways. To keep somebody from a distance from could be he removes them from the world. And that's quite a distance, keeping them from the tribulation. But another way could be to keep them from it, he could warn them, like he did in Matthew 24, to flee. Don't even go back down to your rooftop, get anything, just go and hope that it's not in winter, hope that you're not nursing, go. And if they listen to that warning when it starts, he would cause them to escape safely from and guard them at a distance during. Does that make sense? So what you have to do then is look up the, the scripture that confirms it. There's another scripture in the Bible that uses that exact same definition. And when I read it, it's taught Jesus, and I'm just going to paraphrase it for time's sake. Jesus is talking about his 12 disciples to Father God before he's crucified. And he keeps saying, thank you for giving me these these." You know, you gave them to me. I guarded all of them. I kept all of them. They're all, except for the one, Judas Iscariot. Um, and now I pray, Lord, that you guard and protect them because I'm coming to you and you're going to, you know, re-glorify me to the state that I was before the foundation of the world. And, and then he says, I have given them your word and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. And I'm reading verse 15 out of John 17, 15. He says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. I'm not asking you to remove them from the world. I'm asking you to keep them safe during. So pre-tribulation rapture teachers really can't use that verse anymore in their arsenal because that one can be refuted. And that's all I'm going to say on that. We need to be like Philadelphia, the loving church, who will be protected from the enemy during the time of tribulation. That means we need to be the loving church. Laodicea, justice of the people. And I'm like, justice of the people? I thought Laodicea meant lukewarm. Greek words, definition, justice of the people. Revelation 3, 14 through 22, amplified Greek. And to the angel who exercises guardianship and superintendence over the church of the Laodiceans, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither, listen to this, absent, you're not absent of warm Christian faith and the desire for holiness, nor do you have great excitement and devotion to your belief. I would that you were either hot or cold. So then, because you are wretchedly fluctuating between apathy 
and the fervor of love I will spew you out of my mouth. When I amplified that, it says, I will reject you with extreme disgust. Because that's what you do when you get lukewarm water. You <laughs> spit it out. I will reject you with extreme disgust. So then, oh, it says, because you say, well, I am rich in Christian virtues and eternal possessions. I have earthly wealth and I have need of nothing. And you know not that you are wretched and miserable, destitute of Christian virtues and eternal riches, mentally blind and naked. You know not that you're not even saved in my sight. I advise you to buy gold from me that has been tried by fire, that you may be rich in eternal spiritual possessions and put on white garments, which symbolize innocence and purity of soul, and you won't be shamed by nakedness. And anoint your eyes with the true knowledge of the spiritual condition, of your spiritual condition, and the claims of Christianity so that you can truly be saved. As many as I love, I punish and chasten. Be enthusiastic in your pursuit of good, therefore, and change your mind for the better. Be willing to correct your past sins. Behold, I stand among you, in the midst of you, seeking entrance into your souls by knocking symbolically at your hearts. If any man hears and yields obedience to the plea of my voice and gives me entrance into his soul, I will come into him, and I will make him to share in my most intimate and enjoyable interaction. To those Christians who hold fast to their faith, even unto death, against the power of their foes, their temptations and persecutions, I will grant them to sit as my associates in the divine administration, even as I also was victorious over all of my enemies and am assisting my Father God as he governs the world. He that hath an ear, let him hear and consider what has been said to the churches. That was the seventh letter. This church of Laodicea had lost their impact on the world because they had become preoccupied with it. They had wealth, and they didn't think they needed God. They thought they were okay. They were wretchedly fluctuating between apathy and the fervor of love. Amen. He calls himself the amen. Amen holds the idea of finality. What is the last word we say in every prayer? So be it. Amen. Jesus is the amen in every person's life on the planet. We will stand before him one day and he will be our judge and our jury. He will either reward us or punish us. He is, Laodicea means the justice of the people. And now I understand why it means that, not lukewarm. <laughs> he is the justice of the people. He is the amen in our lives. I watched a movie one time called God is Not Dead. How many of you guys saw that movie? God is Not Dead. Most powerful scene in it. Um, Dean Cain played the rich son. Comes into his mother's hospital room. She's completely just zoned out. She's got dementia. And you can see him behind in focus, and she's blurred, and she's just staring. And this is what he says to his mother. He says, you prayed and believed your whole life. You've never done anything wrong. And here you are. You are the nicest person I know, and I'm the meanest. You have dementia. My life is perfect. Explain that to me. And then it phases him into blur and it focuses in on her. And you can see her eyes. They go from being glazed to kind of being lucid. She doesn't look at him. She just looks straight ahead. And this is what she says. Sometimes the devil allows people to live a life free of trouble because he doesn't want them turning to God. Your sin is like a jail cell, all nice and comfy. So it doesn't seem like you have any need to leave. But the door is wide open. But one day, time runs out and the cell door slams shut, and suddenly it's too late. We don't need to have the Laodicea syndrome and be lukewarm and lost. We need to wake up. I always tell people, your life is a blip on the radar scope of eternity. So why don't you live it the best you can for Jesus? Because eternity is a long, long time. If these letters didn't speak to you, I need to check you for a pulse. <laughs> no, I'm like, sometimes when I have to teach these letters, I'm like, I am going to stomp on some toes. I'm going to stomp on some theology. But guys, I gave you scripture. That's what I did tonight. 
And if you want my verses and everything, I just go online on Sunday night, find chapter three and download the notes and print them out because every scripture I gave you, everything I read tonight will be in that. Um, next week, we're done with the letters. Everybody's like, shoo, let's get into this book. Why did he do this? Why did he tell us so much stuff about these churches? Because there's going to be a reason. We will find out. But next week, chapter four and five, I'm going to do together because we're going to go with John into the throne room of heaven via 95 to 96 AD. So if you want to know who's up there, what's up there, where God and the angels reside, what it looks like, John is literally going to get a, a little um, spirit trip into the throne room of heaven. So come next week, 6.15 for dinner, 7 to 8 for class. For those of you watching online, um, lessons will be up every Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening on shaycaffee.com. So you all be blessed. Are there? We have time for just a few questions. Does anybody have a quick question? I was wondering, instead of seven churches, if there are not seven kinds of people in every church. Yes. Well, that's why he says, okay, so he ends the letter with, he who has an ear. <laughs> uh, do we have ears? It applies to all of us. He who has an ear, let him hear and understand what has just been said to these churches because it is for us. Yes. Amen. Anything else? All right, y'all, we ran a little bit late, but what, what do you think? Did you learn anything tonight? <laughs> We're all going to go home and repent. <laughs> I love you guys, um, and we will see you next Thursday night. Be blessed. I'm going to pray you out. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everybody here. Lord, I just want to pray that the words that were spoken tonight will just go straight into the hearers' hearts and that it will just begin to transform them. Holy Spirit, convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Transform us, Holy Spirit, to be more like Christ. It's all about you. In your precious name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, y'all have a blessed night.